Thank you all for joining us for the introduction to nonprofit leadership, a panel discussion workshop. Joining us today, we have Sue DeBella, Executive Director, UNLV Community Engagement, Dr. Nikki Bates, Director of Educational Media Services at Vegas PBS, Mauricia Baca, Executive Director at the, Nat the Nature Conservancy of Southern Nevada, Dr. Aaron Krolikowski, VP for the Community Impact United Way of Southern Nevada, and Dr. Jessica Word, Academic Director of Nonprofit Community and Leadership Initiative. Today, you'll learn the most important responsibilities of a nonprofit manager, understand the roles of key players in nonprofits, and gain an idea on how to strengthen essential skills important to the nonprofit sector. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Sue to get us started. Thank you. Thank you, Carly, uh, and thank you for introducing our, our speakers today. Um, as Carly said, I'm Sue DeBella, Director of Community Engagement at UNLV, and I work with all of these folks in one way or another and have worked with many of them for, for several years now. Um, I think they are they're the best when it comes to the nonprofit uh, leadership area, and I think they'll you'll enjoy hearing from them today. Um, I would like to go through one by one with our speakers and just ask them to tell us a little more about themselves. So I'm going to start with you, Mauricia, if that's okay. Um, can you just give us a little background about yourself, your title, your credentials, length of service, former post, anything you want to share? Sure thing. Thank you so much, Sue. So my, my title, I'm the state director for the Nevada chapter of the Nature Conservancy. The Nature Conservancy has chapters actually throughout the nation and um, Canada, and in fact, throughout the entire world, there are 72 countries where the Nature Conservancy is present, but I get to lead in the wonderful state of Nevada. I have a come full circle in some ways back to the Nature Conservancy. I moved to Nevada in 2005 to work with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, took a bit of a hiatus from 2010 to through 2020 to lead Get Outdoors Nevada, which is a fabulous local nonprofit that does outdoor trails work. Prior to TNC, I worked with the Department of Justice as an attorney. I did environmental litigation um, with the Wildlife and Marine Resources section of their environmental division. And prior to that, I had a um, my nonprofit career, I guess, in some ways started officially when I worked with the New York Public Interest Research Group doing um, transit justice outreach work with the New York Strap New York Public Interest Research Group Strap Hangers campaign. I have always done environmental stuff. I guess actually, really, my first um, nonprofit entryway was doing going door to door fundraising for Greenpeace, which was a adventure in and of itself when I was in high school. So I've always been in this space. Um, I'm excited to be here and be able to join these other wonderful leaders and talking about the outdoor space and the nonprofit space and what nonprofit leadership means. And thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. Awesome. Thank you, Mauricia. Um, Nikki Bates, you're next up. Hi, everyone. And Sue, also, thank you for inviting me to participate. I think these are these are great forums for uh, questions and information to be shared for sure. Um, I am a lifelong Nevadan, lifelong Las Vegan. Um, been here since, oh, since I was about a month old from California. Um, my passion is education. I started out in the corporate world um, and went to my boss and said, you know, I can't just be about your bottom line, right? Can't just be about money coming in the door. Got to change the world. So I changed my, totally did a 180, changed my career focus and went into education. I thought, you know what? The only way to save the world is to save kids because they are going to be what controls our future. So I know it sounds very cliche, but it's just kind of true. <laughs> just kind of. So that's uh, what I did. So I consider myself an incredibly, um, business minded educator in that I understand what it takes to do good and it takes funding. It takes a business plan. A lot of times when we work from the heart and we work from service, we forget that all of those business ideals really do make sense, right? In the nonprofit world, in the do good world. So I have a very sound understanding of that. Um, so I consider myself just a little bit different than somebody who 
goes into education right from high school, college, and then becomes a teacher. Um, I just have that that real solid background. So I am involved in anything and everything having to do with education. I have been for almost 30 years now. So I'm happy again to be here and uh, be representing the nonprofit side of Vegas PBS. Thank you so much, Nikki. Aaron Krolikowski, you're next. Thanks, Sue. Hi, everybody. My name is Aaron Krolikowski, and I am the interim vice president of community impact at the United Way of Southern Nevada. I've been working with the United Way Network since 2013, and I've been working with the United Way here in Las Vegas since 2016, so a little over five years at this stage. Um, and the structure of United Way is uh, kind of similar to what you heard from Mauricia in terms of the Nature Conservancy. United Way has 1,100 different organizations in our network um, in North America alone, and globally, internationally, there are 1,800 United Ways around the world. So. From a from a nonprofit perspective, the reach of the organization is great, uh, and it's a wonderful network to get involved in uh, from a career perspective. It definitely, there's a lot of opportunity at all levels and in all functions of the organization um, in nearly every community in North America and um, in many communities around the world. Um, in terms of my background, um, I do hold a PhD in geography, um, and I came to the, the nonprofit sector from academia. Uh, and my master's work was in community and international development. Uh, so there's, there's some continuity there. Uh, but I have to say I was closely involved with community development work and nonprofit organizations long before I did the work professionally. I kind of found my way into it, um, and I'm just really excited to be here today with all of you. Uh, to reflect a bit and share from uh, from my experience personally and then as well from our experience at United Way of Southern Nevada. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. That's great. Uh, Jessica, you're up. Dr. Word. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Jessica Word. I'm actually a faculty member at UNLV and I, I lead our gra uh, a graduate program um, in nonprofit management. It's our graduate certificate in nonprofit management. Um, but uh, my experience with nonprofits includes, you know, both my personal life and my professional life, and basically all my teaching, research, and service go to nonprofits. Uh, so, in terms of research, uh, I study nonprofit capacity and management issues, and um, in particular around nonprofit human resource management and how we manage people and and motivate them in the nonprofit sector. Uh, but actually, over the last Two years now, uh, I've taken sort of a, a right turn and I've been looking at sort of the impact of COVID-19 on nonprofits, both here locally and nationally, um, including the impact and efficacy of the um, Paycheck Protection Program for nonprofit organizations um, that we'll be presenting in Atlanta in, in about two weeks now, so <laughs> at, at, at a national conference. So, um, in other words, I, I, I basically, Eat, sleep, and breathe nonprofits all the time. <laughs> and, and then my daughter's a Girl Scout, so we also have that going all at once. So. See, you're a perfect contributor to this conversation, Jessica. I think it's very important you're here. Um, thank you all. Those are that's I, I learned more about you from from hearing your uh, descriptions of your backgrounds. Uh, let's jump in and some of you addressed this a little bit, but I want to get into the, like the more specific idea of what brought you to work in not the nonprofit sector. I mean, we talked about in the in the lead in the introduction to this course that, you know, nonprofits are viewed as an important force for good. So that's naturally a reason that people are drawn to it. But what brought you into the nonprofit space in particular? And we'll try to stay roughly in the order we started. So there's not this jockeying, but feel free to jump in. Anyone can jump in anywhere. So Mauricia, go ahead. Unmuting myself, it wouldn't be a, a, a WebEx or a Zoom without somebody and not unmuting themselves. Uh, I, I've i always been drawn to the nonprofit space. I think it's just uh, the way I'm wired. I noted that I started canvassing for Greenpeace when I was in high school. Um, I guess I'm kind of a dyed in the wool sort of tree hugger, social activist kind of person. Um, and I have not ever actually worked in the corporate space. The closest I got was with the Department of Justice working for a, a federal entity. Um, and for me, it's always been this drive, I think, to feel a little bit 
as though my life has a higher purpose. I, I have a strong drive to to give back and um, and I've always felt so connected to the environment. And so for me in my pro nonprofit space, nonprofit service, I've always gravitated and focused in, in that arena. Um, in addition to that, having grown up in New York City and having grown up with a, a father who is a first generation immigrant from Mexico and experiencing the challenges of being very poor in that urban context, I, I also have felt a strong drive to in some ways pay it forward because I feel really lucky that I was able to get some great education, um, get myself into a private college, um, get that kind of boost and assistance. And I, with Get Outdoors Nevada, for instance, had an opportunity to pay it forward and um, give back to other kids and hopefully inspire other kids. And I see work in, around the environment and in the nonprofit space as a way of, um, again, paying it forward for the next generations and hoping that I leave this place just a little bit better than where I found it. That's awesome, Mauricia. Did you did you have any academic training? And I want all the rest of the speakers to talk about that as well. Like talk about what brought you and then what your academic training is. Did you have any academic training on non nonprofit management or leadership? I did not have prior academic training before I entered into the nonprofit space. When I um, was brought on board with Get Outdoors Nevada as their executive director, I had never led a nonprofit. And what I did was I wound up ordering like 20 different books about nonprofit management before I started. And I did a massive search of different types of best practices and kind of did my own education. And uh, leading a small nonprofit is a deep dive in many ways because you are you wear many, 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 many hats. <laughs> so but it um, might have I, been easier to just take a class. Is that the <laughs> idea? Or get a certificate. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I learned how to I learned how to uh, fly the plane while I was flying it. Basically, yeah, um, yeah. it was a valuable experience. But I think that um, for those who have the advantage of taking some nonprofit training before they get into nonprofits, I think that that is a great route. It really is a professional enterprise, and it's something that I took very seriously when I was leading Get Outdoors Nevada, and now as a state director with the Nature Conservancy. That while it's the intent is not to generate a profit. You're still in. You're still responsible for the fate of the human beings that work with you. Um, you are still responsible for maintaining a bottom line because you still have to uh, address the fiscal needs of your organization. And so it's a professional enterprise, even though it's not one that's centered around creating a profit for shareholders. That's a great point, Mauricia. Appreciate that. Okay, so Nikki Bates, what brought you to the work and what uh, any academic training? Not unlike Mauricia's story, um, I came from a family where college was laugh actually like that wasn't even a possibility. And um, high school for me was all about learning work skills because I knew the day after I graduated high school, I was going to be on my own. So the reason I chose education is because it was teachers who told me in high school, wait a minute, what do you mean you're not going to college? And I just kind of looked at them like, uh, yeah, not even possible. I was learning shorthand and typing and knew I had to be job ready when I graduated because I actually was in my own apartment like weeks after, a couple of weeks after I graduated high school. And so I had to support myself, number one. But that teacher, those teachers that shepherded me through high school basically said, no, 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 you're, you're way too smart. You have to go to college. Here's how to do it. I got the Pell Grant. My family, my mother was from the South and believed that women just got married. Women going to college was not even a concept that she believed in or was even familiar with. So those teachers are what got me. And once I started in academia, I won't tell you when, because I'm really old, because I said shorthand. So those of you who <laughs> know that, no, I'm pretty old. But uh, once I got started in academia, my first uh, at UNLV, my first courses that I took there, I was hooked. There was nothing that was going to stop me. Nothing. I got married, had my children, worked full time, and never stopped going to college until I got my doctorate. They call it the terminal degree, right? 
never stopped. And even after I got my doctorate, I still was like, what next? You know, I almost went back to law school. They have a part-time law school. <laughs> so, I mean, being part of that, I, if it weren't, weren't, if it wasn't for those teachers in high school, I would have gone, ended up on a completely different path. And uh, so I wanted to give back. I wanted to give back to those teachers by honoring that profession and just how they saved me as a child. I wanted to do that for kids as well. So that became that's awesome. my passion. That's, that's such an awesome story. I want to, before I go on to Erin, I just want to ask this, uh, this question of Jessica. Um, Jessica, how long have academic credentialing uh, programs been around for exactly. nonprofits? Has it just been in the last in school? Yeah, I'm sorry. It didn't exist when I was in school. I was uh, yeah, I don't think so for me either. Yeah, uh, academic training for nonprofit work did not exist. So back then, yeah. So the first programs really started probably in the 1980s. Uh, so they're relatively young. Um, in fact, our, our NOVA, which is the, the big uh, professional association for people who study and do research around nonprofits, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. And for a long time, it was a really tiny group of people that came from lots of different academic disciplines like history and sociology and public administration and um, mm -hmm. and even law um, and and all sorts of sort of Kind of a grab bag of people who are interested in these weird little things called nonprofits. Uh, and again, I'm not saying they're. <laughs> I I want to also say that I kind of fell in love with them. So I came from a public policy background, had worked in political campaigns, and and even done a short stint on Capitol Hill. And and as I was doing that, you know, the frustration with gridlock and and not being able to fix the things that I wanted to fix in the world were what led me to nonprofits. And the people that were amazing and started these organizations and ran these organizations and got up every day and said, you know, there's something wrong in my community and I'm gonna do something about that today. I'm not gonna wait for some law to get passed or some funding to come through. I'm gonna start this organization and build it from scratch and 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 bring pieces of my community together. Um, but yeah, those programs are really new um, and most of them, again, aren't standalone yet. So where uh, I started the one at UNLV when I got here in 2006, uh, and it's still just a grad certificate, not a full blown master's. And I think there's only a handful of full blown standalone master's degrees in the country. Jessica, did you come up through the public administration academic program? I did. Uh, and so nonprofit management programs are still situated in a lot of public admin programs and then colleges of business have a few of them as well. Um, social entrepreneurship is what they're sometimes called in college business. Um, and then uh, a few other places, social work uh, sometimes has a track as well. Very good. <laughs> oh, what is a grad awesome. certificate? Should I answer that or? <laughs> oh, that's a great idea. Please jump in. Sorry, Erin, we're coming back to you, Erin. Hold, just give Jessica, that's. <laughs> That's a good question. So a graduate answer. certificate is sort of like a minor in graduate school. Um, it's or, or almost like half of a master's degree. They're designed to be to either be standalone or taken in conjunction with a master's program. Um, our grad certificate in nonprofit management is 15 credits. Um, so in our program, in our departments, uh, you can automatically apply those credits to your master's degree with us. If you're in another department, you need to consult your grad coordinator uh, to see if you can count some of those credits as electives in your in your degree program. But we've had a few students from other programs as well come in um, from social work and, and other places, uh, even history, I think. <laughs> right, that's interesting. All right, thanks, Jessica. That's really interesting background for yourself and the programs. Erin, uh, about your background and uh, how you came to nonprofit work and any academic training around this. Definitely. So uh, I have to say that I grew up in a place that was going through uh, a lot of change while I was growing up. And that's really the, I guess, origin of my interest in kind of the issues that I'm working on today with United Way. Um, I grew up in a place called Buffalo, New York, which is the second largest city in upstate, in New York state. Um, but it was going through while I was growing up, it was going through some of the most challenging issues that kind of came up from deindustrialization, globalization. Uh, you know, it, the country was suburbanizing at the time, um, and I grew up kind of witnessing 
mass poverty, mass job loss, just a lot of population decline, you know, friends, family moving away when I was really young. And so what I saw in Buffalo while I was growing up really stimulated this early interest in questions and understanding why communities and cities kind of rise, why they fall, uh, the ways that our local economies are built, how they, how, how everything's interconnected and how, you know, really how global trends, and we've really seen this during COVID, how global trends can have a huge impact on people at the household level. Um, and we all knew COVID was going, going on, so we're all very aware of it, but there are so many other massive global trends happening that are almost invisible to us that kind of affect, uh, have a real effect for, for regular everyday people in terms of questions, can they pay their rent? Can they pay their electricity bill? Uh, can you know? Can they afford to go to college? Can their family uh, afford uh, the time that that student might take to go to college? And so, there's a lot of things that happen at all these different levels of society and our economy that change kind of the outcomes at the household level, and that uh, that just fascinates me. I have to say, and so my educational pathway uh, it did take me. Uh, through a, through a public university, I studied political science and environmental studies, uh, trying to understand again, you know, why cities are rising and falling, uh, and why my city was rising and falling. Uh, but I spent a lot of time taking what I learned in the classroom, and I took it right out into the community, and I started applying, you know, theories, concepts, skills, um, and often nonprofits were the ones who were more than willing to give me either an unpaid internship. Uh, or to have some free, you know, some free labor, really, and some um, emerging skill sets. So I can't under uh, understate that enough. How important that is to to recognize that what you're learning in the classroom, what you're learning through your educational programs, everything is directly applicable. Even if it doesn't feel like it, there is a way to apply it, apply that skill, apply that learning uh, right right now today. Um, out in the community somewhere, and uh, it's up it's up to us to find uh, those opportunities. And so, years of doing this, kind of going to class, and then going you know going off campus to to work on my weekends and then over my evenings, you know, volunteer and whatnot. Uh, this turned into a professional calling, um, and I start I, I structured my graduate uh, and doctoral research around it. Uh, I went to the UK, uh, where I felt uh, I'll just say there weren't a lot of programs, academic programs at the graduate level in the United States focused on international development and focused on community development, principles, practices, theories. Um, and so I went overseas, the, the United Kingdom, uh, England is, uh, it's kind of, they're, they're experts in global development because of their, uh, their history with empire, with the British empire uh, and their international ties. And so it was just a great place for me to be. And I focused on uh, the equitable provision um, and financing of water services in East African cities. Uh, so I was looking at public and community services, doing a lot of data analysis, working with people at all levels from you know, community water suppliers all the way up to the Minister of Water um, and trying to understand you know, just issues in community and public service delivery. Um, and again, I quickly realized that I can apply this knowledge to most public and community services anywhere in the world, uh, which led me to United Way. And I've already talked a little bit about the global reach of that organization. Um, but in terms of formal academic training, I mean, I took a few classes, uh, grant writing, public policy making. I remember I took one called Urban Politics. Uh, but I, gotta, I have to say, in general, uh, really succeeding and becoming a full-on nonprofit, uh, nonprofit leader, or becoming a leader in the nonprofit sector, you need to learn by doing. Uh, it's all, I would say, you know, academic credentials will get you so far. That experience, that skill set, that, that, you know, growing your brain, to nurturing your education will get you to a certain point. Uh, but to see everything play out um, through our bureaucratic processes, through our policy process, our budgetary processes, to see how people's lives change um, on, on the day to day basis. Um, you need that real world experience off campus uh, to really prepare for success in nonprofit management. That's awesome. Can I, can I interject one second? I would also like to say that uh, a lot of our students are already working in the sector and are coming for kind of those specific skills of budgeting or, or uh, advocacy or, or things like that. So they're, they're, they're yes and like academic training and real world experience. Yeah, thank you. We are, that's a good, that's a good pitch for UNLV, Jessica. I appreciate that. Did I can just jump in. Nothing like applying it, right? 
I have to say, if I could go back and do it again, I would want that experience before going in to, to get that education. I got gotcha. you. Um, so yeah. I, think, I think that's the right way to do it, how a lot of the students are, uh, as you just that's described. Okay. Well, that's, that's great. Um, so tell us, let's start with Mauricia again. Uh, what are your most important responsibilities as a leader? And what are, what are the most challenging ones of those responsibilities? It's an excellent question. Uh, I, as a leader, you're, you're really setting the tone for the organization. And so part of part of what I've always taken really seriously as a responsibility is establishing a good workplace. Um, those of us in the nonprofit sector, you know, are typically not getting into this for the money. If you are, then you're kind of misguided in terms of your professional choice. But I've taken it really seriously that what I can do as a leader is create a good workplace so that there is that benefit to working um, in that in this nonprofit social sector. Um, and that that entails making sure that I establish a clear vision and mission for what we're doing, that I create a workplace where people feel comfortable and supported. So it it, it really disperses through many different levels. Um, I need to re relate well and support my direct reports so that they in turn can do the same for their direct reports. It really um, kind of ripples through the organization. Um, things like also, I, I've had some conversations with some folks about letting people know that I respect the fact that there really is an importance of work-life balance and, um, and letting people be human and giving each other grace and allowing the fact that we're all going to work really hard. I think all of us respect and understand that, but making sure that people take that space for themselves as well. So in terms of what I think of as my most important responsibility, it's caring for the human resources that are my organization and making sure that they are supported and sustained because without them, we are literally just a logo and we're not able to accomplish any of the good work that we need to accomplish. And so if I do that job well, then we can do the projects and we can get the messaging out and we can accomplish the great things that we need to do for conservation. But it really starts with caring for the, the human beings that work for the organization. And obviously there's the fiscal side of that, but that all loops into caring for those human beings and making sure that I do the things that need to be done in order to ensure that we are a stable and secure workplace and a place that people enjoy the idea of going to, even if it's virtual. You know, all I can say, Mauricia, is I think we'd all like to work for you. Having <laughs> a boss that cares about our employees, that's really an important feature. So, um, Nikki Bates, you're up. Uh, we're talking, I'm sorry, to repeat the question is, what are your most important, important responsibilities and what are the most challenging responsibilities among those overall responsibilities? Well, of course, ditto. With, I mean, what Mauricia said is so incredibly important and staff staffing was the very, the very first thing that came to mind. Um, not only supporting the staff that you have, because again, in the nonprofit world, they're certainly not getting paid what they would make in private, private industry for sure. Um, so that's hugely important, but, um, and then you mentioned the fiscal side and that's where my brain went immediately, which was how do I sustain uh, those resources? How do I sustain that staff? I have um, three on my staff that are paid solely through uh, philanthropic uh, and grant related funding. So, I mean, that that is just on my mind every fiscal year. How do I ensure sustainability, ensure those um, that those salaries can be paid, right? So that is the most challenging. And, you know, I've got a, I've got a, you know, 50 page grant application sitting right in front of me that I, I need to get done. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm constantly, constantly looking for funding and always, always um, applying for foundations and grants and everything that I can do to sustain the work, which means I have to sustain the people, right? So sustain the people, not just emotionally and keeping them wanting to come, come to the building, come here, do the work, but also make sure they can get paid to do it. A decent a decent wage, so 
Yeah, that's absolutely. I think in the nonprofit world, one of the biggest um, responsibilities. Awesome. That's a good, very good point. Uh, we'll get back in order. Aaron, you're next. Thanks, Sue. I can't agree with Mauricia and uh, Nikki enough in terms of the importance of of that team. Um, I know we spoke a little bit about the uh, the can do it attitude uh, for that that we see in terms of a lot of the staff that come to work for nonprofits. A lot of people are inspired from their own personal lives or something that might be happening out around the world. Um, so keeping that team is is critically important. Um, and then to go back to what Nikki said. Uh, just making sure that there's enough uh, there's enough revenue. That's where that business mindset comes in. Because yeah. if you're attracting people who you know who who might have just maybe left a grassroots organization or a community group or they're they're just coming into the nonprofit sector for the first time, they're not thinking necessarily about our annual budget or what does our five year strategic plan look like and are we reaching our goals. Um, so it, it it does you know there is a lot of you know, business mindset that that leaders have to bring to the nonprofit sector uh, so that we can, as Nikki, as, as Dr. Bates said, sustain the work over time. Um, if you spend all your money right away, if you get a grant and it's all gone, then you can't do any more work. You can't pay those wonderful people who are uh, motivated uh, to come and change the community in some way. And so, uh, you know, revenue, your team and the relationships with the people that help make the work possible. Uh, those are, I think, the big, uh, the big highlights uh, that I think come come with nonprofit management. Uh, in terms of challenges, I think it does vary. You know, I'll just say staffing is a challenge right now. It's hard to. It's been very hard to find a lot of uh, all, to, to fill all the positions um, that we have necessarily. But I'll say in the longer term, this is a short term problem that we know we'll get past. But in the longer term, you know, it it. The challenges may differ organization by organization and you know working for united way we are a community fundraiser we're also a community grant maker um, and we have just very high expectations um, that we have to meet uh, in order to support the community um, if you ask 100 people what united way should be doing you will get 100 very different but equally meaningful responses um, and so in that way as the leader of our community impact team I would say that of all of my responsibilities, kind of managing expectations in a practical and pragmatic way uh, is a challenge that I deal with on a daily basis um, and one that is some, some, <laughs> sometimes really difficult to face on a daily basis. But um, <clears throat> we do get to do a lot of really, really wonderful work with the fundraising and grant making that we, uh, that we do do. Awesome, Aaron. Um, Jessica, I'm gonna ask you to spin this just a little bit differently <laughs> and talk about, um, when you teach this the class about nonprofit management, what are the, what what do you say are the challenges? Is there anything that that the rest of the speakers haven't covered? Uh, I I think they spoke to a lot of the challenges really eloquently. I think uh, one of the the key aspects of of leading a nonprofit is really at, you know at that leadership level. Their job is really to take care of the organization, right? So that means bringing in outside support. Um, also, dealing with the day to day staffing and and capacity needs of the organization, whereas people who work lower down in the, or, in the organization worry about sort of their program or their day to day duties um, and don't necessarily have to do all that connective tissue of um, there's a ton of outreach and external support pieces that go into nonprofits that are kind of unique. So, uh, because a lot of times we're asking people to give money. To pay for things that don't directly benefit them, right? <laughs> uh, that's what phil philanthropic support is. That we're saying, if you want a better community and you believe in what we're doing, then then you need to help us pay for these things. Jessica, that's one of the other part. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the I I actually took this class not from you, but I did take the graduate level. Uh, nonprofit management class, and one of the things that struck me was the number of regulations of nonprofits that you you need to know about, and, and that's that's a whole field I would think of a whole class in and of itself, probably, right? Yeah, and and there are there are sets of rules that come from the IRS and from getting your tax exempt status that that create sort of an environment that make even some of the funding issues a little bit more uh, tricky. So, for example. Um, there's what we call donor intent. So if a donor gives uh, 
a gift and and says you can only use it for this unless you go back and get their permission you can only use it for that so obviously during the last year as as we had a ton of unpredictability and a lot of shifting around for organizations that was really tricky right cuz i have this money and i'm only supposed to use it for this but now i need to pay for high speed internet for my staff to work from home i need more computers i need <laughs> Uh, a thousand things that I didn't budget for, uh, hand sanitizer, masks, etc. Um, and so that that uh, those sort of bigger pieces can create real sort of operational uh, challenges. Uh, but having that community support around uh, that's willing to support you and trust that you're going to make good decisions and not restrict those funds also makes a big difference in, in being able to meet those challenges when they occur. And it's helpful to have some of that expertise on your board from what we have. We aren't even going into the whole nonprofit board management <laughs> area, but uh, your board might be able to bring you some of that expertise in various areas too, right? Yes. So uh, I would also say that's another big challenge that they didn't talk about is that that relationship with your board. So you have this group of individuals who are volunteers. Uh, they're, they're high profile volunteers, but they're volunteers who are uh, legally and fiduciary responsible for your organization and even if you founded that organization and uh, created it all on your own and with all your blood sweat and tears they can fire you from that organization <laughs> uh, and so that's also a unique challenge that you have a group of volunteers that that is really uh deeply involved in in sort of leading the organization and is somewhat similar to a corporate board but also very different yeah that's a really good point um, speaking of that, what are some of the, uh, the next question we're going to hit is, uh, what are the other key roles or, or key leaders that you work with in your organizations? What are, what are the most important roles to make leadership happen at nonprofits? Mauricia? I would build on what Jessica just said, actually, which is our, our, our board of trustees and the nature conservancy has an interesting um, organizational setup in that our fiduciary responsibility is actually only at our global world office. So our chapter trustees are more of our, our partners in many ways. And um, I think they have sort of a glorious opportunity because they get to be our board of trustees, but they don't have res fiduciary responsibility. Um, but they are leaders and they all come, they, they're they all leaders in their own fields and they come with sets of expertise that are so incredibly valuable and they can be some of our best partners in the work that we do. Um, there are also leaders that we engage with who are external to the organization and really so much of success comes with collaboration. It's something that you do every day, Sue, um, but collaboration and partnership and every single project that the Nature Conservancy engages in Nevada involves collaboration and partnership with other entities, whether that's a local organization or a state entity, federal, um, municipal. So the the leaders and the team members that you're engaging with in those organizations are just critical. And I would say that other leaders, I, I think Jessica makes an excellent point in donor intent and your your membership, your donors are people to whom you are really very much responsible. And we take that res that relationship really seriously. Um, I think it's critical that you don't think of those donors as human checkbooks. Those are human beings who care so much about what you're doing and honoring that and respecting that and making sure that you are achieving the results and goals that they want you to achieve is so incredibly important. And looking at those at those engagements as relationships, because it, it is a relationship with the donors. Um, and at the end of the day, it all comes down to with all of those relationships, your credibility, both your personal credibility and your organizational credibility. And I think that's actually one of the most critical things, because when you lose your credibility, that's incredibly hard to ever get back. So making sure that you're um, caring for all those elements of your um, of your organization helps maintain that 
in essential and critical credibility. Um, oh, it's exactly. all, so much of it is engaging with leaders at all of those different levels. Sure. Um, Appreciate that, Mauricia. Uh, Nikki Bates, what do you got for us on that one? What are the key roles in leadership where you work? Sorry, you're muted. Sorry, Nikki, you're muted. Sorry, of course. Sorry. Um, again, I was saying more yet. I mean, she she said it all right there. It's really about those relationships, key roles, um, not only relationships with like we have two boards. We have a governing board and a fiduciary board. So relationships building, solidifying the your relationship with them, but then also jumping off of their relationships with others in the community, right? Um, also, you yourself being on other boards uh, in the community, other like-minded nonprofits, right? So you really, it, it really ties into that sustainability of your own organization. And that sustainability means that you have to be on boards and you have to have those relationships with your own board members and then relationships with your board members' relationships. So it, it's that branching out that helps you to survive as a nonprofit. So those being that person um, is huge. And I think a lot of times when you be, especially those of us who didn't have the opportunity to get that, you know, that certificate in nonprofit management, and as Aaron said, that you don't realize um, that piece of sustain of sustaining a nonprofit of how much you have to be out there and um, how important those relationships are. And then to the, to the piece, Mauricia, about, um, you know, you have to be genuine. And if you're genuine and you are, you are true to your mission and the mission of the organization, I really think that's the starting point and then everything else will grow from there. Well, that's, that's lovely, yeah, absolutely. Aaron, uh, your thoughts on the other key players at United Way of Southern Nevada? Definitely. Well, so I th Marisa and, uh, and, and Nikki definitely shared a good view of kind of the, our external partners in the nonprofit sector. And I just want to share a few comments on kind of our internal partnerships and what internal leadership might look like as well. Um, I know at United Way on our community impact team, well, we we're organized into departments or we call them teams. So the community impact team uh, at United Way, we have key professional roles, leadership roles in early education, emergency assistance programs, volunteer management and community and government affairs. So a lot of the work that you might think of when you think of traditional nonprofit work. Um, but more broadly, you know, we have a, a fundraising team as well. We have a finance team, we have a marketing team, facilities managers and IT professionals. Um, and so understanding uh, what each team needs and being able to translate uh, across those teams and kind of facilitate collaboration within the organization um, is, is a key skill, I think, uh, in terms of understanding those roles and getting people to work together uh, in a really productive way. Um, and I think it's important to remember that a lot of nonprofit organizations are often structured very similarly to their private sector counterparts, uh, the corporate counterparts. So you'd expect to see a lot of the same business functions in nonprofits as you'd find in any other company. That makes perfect sense. Um, I should just mention we're we're getting tight on time. So uh, Jessica, do you have anything to add to that on the uh, leadership uh, roles? Just really quickly, the other thing that's important to note is a lot of nonprofits are relatively really small. Uh, and so you may be thinking about, uh, you know, now, while there are some really large ones, uh, Vegas PBS is, is in the medium to large category here in town. And obviously the nature conservancy is part of a big national network. A lot of them are small. So it's almost like a, a small business mom and pop style place at a lot of these places where. Uh, the executive director is the head of our HR, is the development person, is the <laughs> uh, We're in many CFO, hats. Uh, and they have a pro one program manager and one volunteer manager, and that's the whole staff. That um, makes sense. And so you, so when you talk about key roles, the key role is 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 the staff. There, like I said, uh, I think the average um, staff size for nonprofits in the U.S. Uh, last time I looked was was less than ten people. Really? Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, there are there are really big ones like 
Harvard <clears throat> University is huge, right? Um, and uh, hospitals that are nonprofits are huge um, and big international ones. But then there are a lot of like people who just have one person or just a part, even a part time person or, all, or are all volunteer led that, that are technically nonprofits. Well. That's interesting. Yeah. Wow. So our next question, and this is going to be our final question before we open it up for our participants to ask their questions. Um, and this is going to be a lightning round. I'm going to ask you to just give me three to five items, just one, two, three, real fast. And that is, what are the essential skills for your job in your uh, your nonprofit? Or Jessica, in your case, what your perception of those are from teaching this area and being an expert in it. Mauricia, go. <laughs> uh, organizational skills, compassion, and um, openness. Nice. All right, Nikki Bates. Communication, collaboration, and heart for service. Nice. Aaron. Uh, patience, vision, and the ability to translate uh, across multiple audiences. Very good. Jessica. Sorry, I didn't unmute for a second. Uh, I would say uh, follow through. So uh, I would also say uh, determination. These It's hard to start and run a nonprofit. Um, and then I'd also say, yeah, those bus that business mindset of it's not just about the cause, it's also about keeping the organization going. Excellent points all I actually wanted to write these down because they're they're nice for a vision statement. I mean, those are that's kind of like the things that you're talking about. I think are very important to, for nonprofits. All right. Uh, <clears throat> thank you all for your your discussion of these really uh, interesting uh, ideas and questions here. I think um, let's open it up to uh, questions uh, from our our uh, listeners here. Um, <clears throat> Oh, Jessica, you mentioned the young nonprofit professional network is a great place to connect. That's a good point. That is great. And you can find them online and they have an organization in Southern Nevada. Okay. Carly, do we have any questions in the chat? I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, except for the one that was already answered. Don't be shy y'all. If you have a question, now's your time. Now's your time. There you go. Yes. I would suggest also for those who are thinking about um, mentors, if there's somebody that you've worked with or you've engaged with in a nonprofit, I don't think you should be shy about reaching out to that person and asking if they might be willing to be your mentor or if they don't have the bandwidth, is there somebody that they think that you might connect with well? I, mean, I think a lot of people are open to that conversation. That's, yeah, great advice. Great I did advice. get a question from the chat. Um, how could nonprofit management lead, relate to an operations manager? Say, can you repeat the question? Yes. How can nonprofit management relate to operations management? Okay. Anybody want to jump in on that? Ooh, I'll try. It is That's not. You, like, Aaron. <laughs> it's, it's not. It's not something I'm super well versed in. Uh, but we do have a chief operating officer at United Way, and that operating that chief operating officer is is responsible for coordinating. Is ultimately responsible for coordinating all those different departments and teams that I mentioned uh, in in the previous answer. Um, and so. Uh, I think they're one and the same in a lot of ways, uh, you know, in the corporate world, we might call it operations management, um, but you're really, it's organizational management. You're, you're managing the day-to-day -day operations. You're making sure that, you know, you're able to, to articulate key goals and navigate your team, support your team to achieving those goals. Um, and then, you know, the, the complexity that comes from different teams having different incentives and different motivations to do different types of work. Uh, operations management, I think uh, I'll just say, I, I don't come from the business world, so I may be speaking out of turn here, uh, but operations management, I'd say a lot of the same principles are kind of, you know, you're looking in a mirror in a way, and it's just a different word for it. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, Erin, uh, or anyone really, uh, is, how about the, like, 
big events that, you know, that that strikes me as an operational function as well. You know, big, you know, when you have big fundraising events, a gala or a fun run or whatever that might be, uh, there's some operations around that as well, right? Anyone? Well, and that speaks to what Aaron was talking about earlier about collaborating internally. For instance, our operations manager would be our business and finance person, right? So if I'm I, that communication, internal communication is huge. I pick up the phone and call him probably one or two times a day to make sure that I'm not going rogue in a sense, like everything I'm applying for, everything I'm doing, here's money that's gonna be coming in the door. Is it okay that I can do this? Is I'm not breaking any rules by going after this pot of money? All of those types of things. Because you spoke to it earlier about all the not the rules around being a 501 C3, right? I, I didn't get that expertise. I don't have that certificate, but my business manager knows all about that. And that would be like our operations manager that would know those roles. So mm -hmm. I'm in constant communication there. Yeah, that's great. Now that makes good Thank sense. Thank you. Sue, I jump in quickly also just to loop back to what Jessica said in that question of operations and it gets into, I see a, a question in the chat about administrative administration parts of nonprofits and hands on parts when you are in a small nonprofit, because when I was with get outdoors Nevada, initially it was me and the board and then I hired my 2nd person and we doubled in size. <laughs> By the time I left, we had 7 full time and 7 part time. Um, but when you are in a small nonprofit, you are operations, you are everything. And so you learn many, many different skills. So it is the, the difference between working in a small nonprofit and a large nonprofit. Um, it is significant. So if you start in a small nonprofit, you just, you, you're, you're rolling up your sleeves and you are, you're doing it all. So. Operations, administration, project work, you wow. got it. You got it all going. It, it's sort of like working in a startup in, in the for profit sector or a small business in the for profit. That sector. makes good sense. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Go we ahead. have one last question that is um, that came in the chat. That's really awesome. I think that you'll have. It might be a good note to end on, or maybe not end on, but here it is. It's been amazing hearing about all the good aspects of nonprofits, but. How have you all dealt with those difficult times, especially when budgeting seems lackluster? Have mm -hmm. any of you ever doubted the nonprofit route? Oh, wow, that is a good question. All right, Mauricia, give it a shot, but let's go, let's go quickly. We're running out of time. I have to actually say, I really enjoy budgeting. I find it soothing because it gives me answers. So the question about like budgeting seeming lackluster, like I like the data and direction that the budgeting process, process gives me. And there are difficult times though. I, it is stressful. I, I had times, especially with a smaller nonprofit, when I was so worried about maintaining my team. And it is a lot of responsibility when you're that leader in a nonprofit organization. But at the end of the day, when we were in that organization, we were able to provide great educational programs for the community. And I could see the, I could literally see the impact that we were having, having it made it worth it. But it is stressful and it, and it's hard, but then again, any job worth having is stressful, whether you're in the nonprofit or the for profit, you're going to have stress. So it's kind of choose your flavor of stress. Good point. Aaron. Any doubts at moments of doubt? What are they about? Well, I think as, as probably with everybody, we all have days when we say, <laughs> why am I doing this? Um, but I think working in the nonprofit sector, uh, just. As long as you stay grounded, as long as you're not just stuck in the administration and you are involved in the hands on day to day work that's taking place, uh, that is uh, there, there's value that comes from that non monetary value, sometimes intangible, um, but value nonetheless. And so I also say that the corporate world and the nonprofit world have gotten a lot flatter and a lot closer in terms of what they look like. So corporations have their own corporate foundations. They have their own corporate social responsibility programs. And nonprofit uh, organizations that they partner with, um, whether it's United Way or those grassroots organizations that Mauricio was talking about, um, there is just a close partnership there. So if I ever felt like I wanted to leave the nonprofit sector, I would probably go find a similar role in the corporate sector, in the private sector. Um, a little bit different, but more or less doing the same work on my day to day. So 
interesting um, how about there. makes good sense nikki how about you um i would just say absolutely there's some hard times for sure and you you start looking for other jobs sometimes really you just kind of click and go okay maybe i can do the same thing somewhere else right and i'll never forget um recently bad day right because sometimes the fiscal is here and sometimes it's here and you just you know you really do worry and it's really hard um but i'll never forget my secretary walked in my office and she knew i was having that day and she said you know something nikki you cannot stop the good and i was just i just looked at her and i'm like oh my gosh you can't stop the good and as long as that's what we're doing it's gonna work out it just is. And, you know, lo and behold, like the next day, something came through and I just looked at her and went, oh, my gosh, what are you, a prophet? You know, it was just like, you know, but I have found that if the work you're doing, it resonates, it's good work. It's going to be supported in some form or fashion. You can't stop the good. That's awesome. I wrote that down, too. That's going to be our motto here. Um, <laughs> Jessica, how about you? Any doubts about either either in nonprofit leadership or as a as in your role teaching nonprofit leadership, uh, we'll see what gets me out of bed every morning is 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 the idea that you can't stop the good that there are people who get out of bed every morning in our community and and want to do these great things right and and uh, working with students who really want to not only use their skills to benefit themselves but their communities and 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 the bigger society that we're all in um, because it takes a lot of those people to actually make everything work correctly. Yeah. Um, and so from that perspective, that's what gets me out of bed every day. And and yeah, this last year was rough. Uh, I had press calling me saying, you know, how many nonprofits are going to close? And I'm like, I don't know. And uh, that was before, you know, some of the ARPA funding or ERA funding came through. Um, and so uh, it was dark uh, last year, right? Uh, we were all stressed about the and huge levels of uncertainty. But I also knew eventually the, the sector would sort of regrow itself. It's one of the unique things about the US and, and our society and has been since our founding that we choose to do a bunch of things outside of government and that includes nonprofits. And um, Alexis de Tocqueville talked about this way back uh, at the founding of our country about how non we built libraries and, and raised barns and did these things as communities that government would normally have done. Uh, in Europe, and so uh, I also think we're part of this really rich sort of American tradition of sort of doing it yourself and 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 making a choice to do something different, and that's what gets people through those bad days. Boy, that's that's wonderful. What a great way to wrap it up, huh? That <laughs> uh, was fantastic. Um, I want to call out uh, as Carly uh, Carly has put the um, <clears throat> little uh, link for us to to for the participants today to or the, the graduate students to answer the questions on the uh, the little feedback survey, if you would. It's the, the blue link over there. If you would be so kind as to copy that and uh, into some other location and, and take that little survey and give us feedback, we always appreciate that. It's good for everyone to hear the feedback uh, so we can know whether we should keep doing these kinds of things or not. I thought it was fantastic. And I wanna thank each of our panelists today for the wonderful things that they brought to the table here. I think this is a great discussion and I'd like to do it again with a different group of students, you know, maybe next semester or next year. So um, thanks, applause to the, to the uh, panelists today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carly and the Graduate College for hosting this and thank you to the graduate students for participating and asking good questions and listening. So hope everyone has a great day. Thank you all.